<laughs> good afternoon and good evening. My name is Dr. James Lanny, and I'm really pleased to have everyone join us and to talk about the introduction and lit review. We're just waiting for a few more people to uh, sign in as people are signing in as we speak. Um, before we get started, I just want a quick question to everybody, and you can send, put it in your chat window. I'm very curious, as we go on to promote our series, you know, I'm curious what are you all are doing for a profession, okay? So two questions. One, what are you doing for a profession while well, other people are signing on by the tens? And just type that into the box if you wouldn't mind. The other quick question is, um, so what's your profession? And there was something else. Ah. And what do you recommend for us to do to promote these series to colleagues and other people like yourself? So if you have thoughts about that, I'd like to get some group think in here. And uh, what do you do for a living currently? And uh, thoughts about promoting us uh, out there. And, uh, and, and I'm interested in your thoughts. And we're going to get started in just one minute, okay? Okay. So uh, and it is... 8.31. I, okay, I think we'll get started even as other people are coming on. We'll just, uh, they will catch up uh, as we move along here. So, as I say, I'm excited to uh, hopefully shed some insight about the introduction of Lit Review and uh, move you guys forward to graduating in 2014. That's the whole goal right here. So let's just get started, okay? I really see the dissertation as kind of an hourglass. And the, obviously, there's an introduction literature review, which is up top. And that could be, often, it's in two different chapters. And then there's the methodology, results, and discussion chapter. So I'm violating my rule a little bit, because typically I say to go for the methodology first. But in keeping with what schools typically do, all right, here's the introduction and lit review. And we'll talk about some of those areas. I also want to say, too, that my colleague Becky is going to jump in at certain points to kind of talk about some of the search and some of the citation uh, 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 things that need to be done during this uh, literature review. So I'm looking forward to Becky coming in and uh, Rebecca will come in and out dur during different parts. Okay, so let's just go forward for the introduction. So what I wanted to do is start out and give you a very concrete example about things that are in the prospectus, but also things that are going to be in the introduction. So here's the simple example, and I want you to think about really simplifying your thinking and simplifying the different steps in the introduction as you go about writing it. So here's my example that I'm going to reference as we go through this. Imagine as a, that we identify that there's bullying going on for boys, and someone comes up with a fantastic intervention Okay, for boys, and they've assessed the amount of bullying before, and then they assessed the amount of bullying after the intervention, and they said, you know what, this intervention worked. But now, there's the problem statement, right? There's a gap in the literature. What we want to know, okay, is this intervention valid for girls age 10 to 12, okay? Maybe there's a different way of bullying, okay? So we don't know if that intervention works for girls. So, so that's the gap, right? The purpose is to assess whether this intervention is working for girls 10 to 12. All right? That's the purpose of the study. All righty. So what's the significance of this? Well, girls bully and we need an intervention. So the so, the so what question is, we want to know what's going to work for in a, a, to, uh, to intervene with girls. All right? Now, you have to talk about the background. Well, what's the background? Well, we know there's gender differences between boys and girls cognitively, emotionally, behaviorally, okay? There's a bullying literature that's evolving, okay, and different interventions perhaps. So this is some of the background information that the reader is going to need to know, and that you want to get them grounded in, right? Here's differences between boys and girls. Here's some of the bullying literature. Hey, here's an intervention that helps reduce bullying in boys, and we're wondering if that same intervention works with girls, right? So... That's kind of the background. You're also going to need a framework. Well, what is that? Some theory that helps us understand why bullying occurs or why bullying occurs in boys and girls. 
And you can take perhaps a Freudian or Ericksonian type of psychosocial development theory, right? Something, you need a theory grounded in the literature, okay? It doesn't have to be the perfect theory, but it has to be a theory that makes sense, okay? Alrighty, and then you can develop a research question. Well, for females, is there a difference in the propensity of bullying for girls pre and post the intervention, right? So that's the kind of question that we can ask. So all of that's going into the introduction, all right? And I, I guess I just want to say one thing about the introduction and the literature review, okay? You really have to think critically about this. You don't have to get stressed about it, but you have to think critically about it. And you have to think critically in the introduction and in the lit review about different ways of critically thinking. Particularly, there's three kinds of ways to think critically. Affective components, cognitive components, and behavioral components. Well, what are affective components? Well, one affective component is that we have to value truth above self-interest, okay? All right? We want to see what the research really says. We want to encourage different divergent views. Tolerate ambiguity. Complex issues have complex answers. Don't look for black and white answers to grayish kind of questions, all right? Recognize your personal biases, all right? Everyone has biases, and that's fine. But identify those biases so they don't cloud your vision and looking at other literature, you know? Or just selecting literature that suits your particular point of view. Cognitively, you want to define the problems accurately, okay? Analyze the data for content. You want to think in a variety of ways, inductively, deductively, dialogically, okay? You want to be able to synthesize information together, okay? Resist overgeneralizations, right? Just because this intervention may be working in a particular part of the country, okay, it may not work in other countries or in other parts of the, or different ethnicities. So, there's different ways, so don't overgeneralize and be really clear about your sample. And, okay, and then um, I, I guess just next, we can just talk about behavioral components. Delay your judgment, okay, don't make snap judgments. Use precise terms throughout your intro and lit, okay? Gather data, all right, and then actively look to justify, okay, actively justify the information that you're presenting, all right? So, other things about the introduction, all right? You have to have the research problem. Everybody really does know what they want to study. I really have met very few people, and I've worked with thousands of people. I've met very few people who didn't know what they wanted to study, okay? So, why study this topic, all right? You have to answer that question, okay? Why is this topic important? Well, in this example, we're talking about it's important because we need interventions to reduce the bullying in females, all right? And we want to know, gosh, maybe, the, again, maybe they're bullying differently, all right? But what is helping, what is helping us to reduce that bullying effect in, in girls, perhaps, all right? What are the key variables, right? How, that is, how am I measuring bullying, you know, before, how is bullying being measured in boys? pre and post an intervention, right? Is it the number of times that they're physically pushing? Is it the number of verbal assaults? Is it the number of Facebook remarks? Okay, what are the variables of interest? How are you measuring these things? You need to tell the reader how you're administering them. So literally, how are you getting that data, okay? So you're laying out for the reader kind of the gist of the study, right? So explain. Well, what I'm gonna do is observe the number of times boys go to detention. Or I'm going to observationally observe the amount of pushing or physicality going on, all right? All right. And then finally, I mean, it really, it doesn't have to be 50 pages long. A few succinct pages will get you there, all right? Okay. So, intro lit, other aspects of it. The lit review is basically you're surveying the body of work. So in this example, we may be surveying gender differences, bullying literature, and how perhaps it differs in boys and girls, perhaps how some of those interventions differ, and perhaps some of those results, all right? We just talked about thinking critically, behaviorally, affectively, and cognitively, okay? 
you have to have a strong argument. You have to pull out not only the strengths, but the weaknesses of other research. Okay? So um, uh, put, that to, put your thinking cap on when you're doing this. All right? All right. Writing skills matter. I hate to tell you, and, and, and I hear it, right? It has to flow, and I, I get it. So, but writing skills do matter. What does that mean? When I write, I keep editing until I run out of time, all right? I have other people look at my work, and when I make a mistake, I correct it as quick as possible, all right? So you have to keep things organized. Use a topic sentence. I don't need you to take a class in writing, but do the basics. Gosh, there's a little book. Let me get this book. Hang on. The Little English Handbook by Colbert, okay, and Finkel, all right? This has got a lot of easy things to do that you don't make basic mistakes about writing. So they talk about coherence. Have an introduction and conclusion to a section, all right? Make it comprehensible for that reader. Make it easy for them. Or as they say, hard writing makes for easy reading. There's no other case better than a dissertation where essentially we're being evaluated, so you want it to be really clear. What happens if you're not clear? What happens if you're not clear is you wind up with lots of edits, you pay for lots more quarters, and your life is delayed for an extra six months. Nobody wants that. Get the book, get help, have people read it, and keep editing. All right? So tell the readers what's been done and identify the gaps in the literature. In my example, tell them what's been done with regard to bullying research, okay? And in my example, hey, you know what? This particular intervention has not been studied with this age of girls, with this intervention, okay? So that's one, you know, look for the gaps. That's part of the critical thinking when you're reading these articles. Identify those gaps. They often tell you what the gaps are in the bottom of their paper, by the way, right? And the end of their discussion chapter and conclusion, they're going to say, gosh, the next research should be this or this. If you find a recent article or a review article, well, a recent article, they're going to tell you what the future research should be. Heed that advice, okay? All right. And then obviously search for relevant information and then look to evaluate it. Okay. The Lit Review. Lit review obviously is providing a context for the study, all right? What's been done? What is that survey of the research, okay? It's got to be obviously empirical, all right, which means that you should have peer-reviewed where they actually find qualitative or quantitative results, all right, something that you can put in context. And it's got to be logical. If it doesn't make sense to you, okay, it's not going to make sense to the reader. All the different components of that intro and lit review need to make sense. But think about it as building an argument. What's the argument? The argument is why I need to study this particular research question with this population, with this instrument, at this time. Okay? Everything has got to go down that hourglass to get to that research question. And it's got to be logical. If you lose people, what's going to happen? It's going to cost you three weeks of your life. Someone's going to scratch your head and say, you know, Billy doesn't know what the heck he's doing. I don't understand what he's doing. Billy, go make this more logical and call me in three weeks. And now you're a quarter down the road. All right. So build a coherent argument, answering the why the study needs to be conducted. All righty. So let's get into some of the tactics of reading articles, right? So how do we search them? How do we read them? How do we organize them? And how do we write them? All right. Okay. The searching. Obviously, the keywords make a huge difference. All right. Keywords make a difference. In my example, gender differences, bullying, interventions, all of that is going to matter. Okay. And Rebecca is going to talk about narrowing and, and, uh, and, and helping with those keywords. All right. The sources matter. They're not going to let you use junk journals, okay, where people paid to get into the journal. Your committee and IRB is not going to let you use that, all right? They have to be peer-reviewed. What are some great peer-reviewed things? Well, textbooks, they're going to be looked at by 70 other professors before a textbook gets published, particularly a late generation. 
things that are in the fourth, fifth, sixth edition, seventh edition. Those things have been looked at over and over and over. And the reason that they're in the seventh, okay, the, the seventh edition is because they're terrific. And they're a great place for overviews. Okay. Peer reviewed journals, dissertations, you know, it's going to be scrutinized. So look at dissertation abstracts. And then research reviews are really helpful as well. So, um, so okay, so start and then start with uh, recent articles. All right, then find a great librarian, a great librarian, and Rebecca is one of those great librarians, and I'm going to plug her in. I'm going to need some help over here. Okay. There we are. Okay. So, and I'm going to uh, let Rebecca take it over from here, and then she'll just tell me how to slide along and uh, take it from there. So, Rebecca, take it away. So as Dr. Lanny said, my name is Rebecca, and I'm just going to be talking this evening uh, about basic search strategies to get you started. So I'll start off by talking about identifying databases and identifying appropriate search terms to be using in your search. And then I'll talk a little bit about expanding or narrowing, depending on how many results that you're getting. Um, and then finally, I'll finish up by talking about using citation chaining to find additional relevant results from results that you've already identified as relevant. So beginning with identifying databases and search terms, think about what are the big databases for your field. For example, PubMed is the big database for medicine. Uh, you probably already know what the big databases for your field are, but if you don't, go ahead and ask someone ask your advisor, ask someone who's doing research in the field, or ask a reference librarian, and they should be able to tell you. And don't feel like you have to limit it to only one database. You're free to use as many databases as you think have information that's relevant to you. Uh, when you're thinking about what terms to use in your search, uh, think about what best describes this topic. You probably already have a clear idea of what terms you want to use, uh, but if you don't, go ahead and do some preliminary searches to help you find out. For example, a few years ago, I had to do uh, research on combining a reference desk and a technology desk, and it's not entirely clear what that would be called, what kind of term would describe that combination. Uh, so a few preliminary searches would help you to know that that's referred to as an information commons or learning commons, which you could then use as your search term moving forward. Once you have your results, uh, consider how many there are. If there are thousands of results, that's probably too many. You're not going to be able to go through all of those, so consider narrowing your search down. On the other hand, if you only have a few results, uh, half a dozen, a dozen, that's probably too few. So consider expanding your search. If you're just narrowing your search, uh, it's pretty easy to just use the filters that are on your, in most databases. Um, this can help narrow things by the year, what type of article it is, is it um, a peer-reviewed article, is it a review, and so forth. Um, but whether you're expanding or narrowing, consider uh, identifying some relevant articles from your initial searches and then note what they use as their subjects and their keywords. And then you can use those to do a new search that's a little more tailored to what you're looking for. So here I'm searching in PubMed, and I just want to find out what are the benefits of chamomile. So I do a little search, chamomile benefits, and this is the result page that you're seeing here. You can see that I got 15 results, and that's actually a fairly small number. So I'm probably going to want to expand my search. But had I wanted to narrow, you can see that there's uh, filters over to the left-hand side of the screen that could be used to do so. Uh, but as I said, I'm going to want to expand. So I'm going to find one of these articles that I think is particularly relevant 
and use it to identify some additional terms to use in my search. So this first article um, looks like it probably could be relevant. It's talking about using chamomile uh, for insomnia. So that could be a benefit to chamomile. So I'm going to take a look at that article and see if there's some additional terms that I could be using in my search to uh, find more articles. So here's this article. Um, you can see it gives you the abstract. So I'm going to read through that abstract and see if there are some more terms there that I could be using. And in the first line, I see that there's a scientific name for chamomile. So that could probably be useful. And once I've looked at the information they give me up there, I'm going to go down and I'm going to look at what the subject terms are. So you can see below this article, um, there's this term here, mesh terms. And that stands for medical subject headings. So that's what uh, in PubMed acts as the subject terms for the article. And in other databases, they'll be called other things, usually keywords or subjects. Um, but I'm going to open this up and take a look at the terms to see if there are any that really are capturing the idea that I want to capture better than I initially did so that I can use those for a search. So here's that section expanded. Uh, and you can just go through this list. See, is there something here that's really saying what I want to say better than how I said it? So I see this term here, plant extracts therapeutic use. So maybe that's really capturing this idea of benefits in a better way. So I can use that term instead in my search or in addition in my search to get at what I'm trying to capture. So here is uh, the result screen from a new search uh, where I've added in or replaced terms based on this article that I just looked at. So you can see here I've added in plant extracts therapeutic use and the scientific name for chamomile. And just from doing that, you can see how the results have gone from only 15 up to 59. And that's a fairly uh, substantial number, probably enough for me to be able to go through and find a good set of articles that will really be relevant to what I'm looking for. So another method that you can use to expand your pool of articles is citation chaining. And citation chaining is really just using a relevant article or other material that you've identified and seeing who they cite or who cites them to find additional relevant resources. Um, so it's fairly straightforward. In most cases, you're reading an article and you see that they're talking about something that you want to talk about. And you go and see who do they cite in this section. Or you simply read through their references section and identify articles that might also be relevant to you. And you use that citation uh, to find those articles. In some cases, you can also kind of do this in reverse, where you find articles that cite the article that you're interested in. Uh, you'll need an appropriate database to do that, uh, where some of them will um, tell you how many other articles in that database cite that article. So let's take a look at how this is done. So here's um, a part of the reference section for that same article that we looked at earlier. And so I can just go through and look at these, you know, look at their title, or if I've been reading, uh, look at the sections that I found most interesting, and go to those articles. They give you all of the information that you need to find them. And in many databases, you'll even have these things like Crossref or these links in PubMed that will take you directly to those articles, making your search very easy. Okay, Muted. terrific. Thank you, Rebecca, and we'll Muted. In, a, in a few moments. And thanks, everybody, for hanging in there. I know it's a, it was faint to hear, and hopefully you uh, turn up the, turned up your uh, speakers a bit so, so we can hear her.
So, okay, so now I want to talk about, so after we have the article, well, how do we go about reading the articles? Well, there's lots of different ways of doing that, okay? So, one strategy for reading is read the abstract, read the introduction, okay, because you want to get to that research question on hand and see if it's relevant. Then, read the topic sentences of the method and results. Skim the discussions chapter where you can find future research, okay? Then if the whole article is interesting, then go back and get into it, all right? So that's one strategy. But while you're reading these things, try to think about what's the problem being addressed here, okay? What is the research question? And not just reading the question, but think, again, critically about the implications of that research question. What's being answered and what's not being asked by that research question, okay? What is the design of the research? What's being studied? How are they studying it? What's the sample size, right? Okay. So maybe they again, maybe it's in a part of one part of the country or in a different time period. And you can say, well, it's been done in the Northeast, but we want to look in the Southwest. Maybe different uh, compositions of people or different age groups. Okay. So look to see not only the sample size, but really what's the composition of that sample. All right. What were the measures used? Again, were they looking in my example that I used earlier? Were they looking at negative words in Facebook? Were they looking at physical, you know, what were they, what physically, what were they actually measuring, okay? And what were the procedures used, okay? How did they actually get that data, right? Constantly be asking the so what questions, all right? It's critical. Be a skeptic. Be the doubting Thomas. So what? Why do this research, okay? Answer that question, particularly in your own study. Make sure you answer that question, all right? Try to get to the heart of it. What's the central theme being asked here? All right. Organizing, obviously, um, keep track. Keep, be systematic about how you keep them, okay? One way to keep track is to say, okay, I want to talk about gender differences, all right? There's a movie analogy between long shots, medium shots, and close-up shots. The close-up shots are the really relevant articles, right? Talking about interventions around bullying, right? For maybe boys or girls or both, all right? But maybe not your particular intervention, all right? That's a close-up shot. You really want to get into detail around that. The long shots might be generally the bullying phenomena, okay, or gender differences, all right? So within the medium shots are kind of this intermediary between a long shot and a close-up shot. So that's one way to keep things organized. When you organize it in that fashion, think about that hourglass again. So perhaps you're going to start out with these long shots, these general kind of references, moving down to medium shots, moving down to, gosh, this article did this, this, and this, but it didn't do that. All right? So keep that in mind. All right? Okay. So now I'm going to transfer it back over to uh, Rebecca again, and she's going to talk for a few more. Hopefully we, um, we, we, we get you a little bit cleaner and, um, okay. And uh, Rebecca, just take it away. So as Dr. Lanny said, I'm just going to talk a little bit about organizing your search. So keeping track of the searches that you've done and the material that you've found in those searches. So to start off, um, when you're doing your searches, it's often very helpful to keep track of what databases you have searched and what search terms you have used. Um, this will allow you to avoid reduplicating your efforts and will also allow you to duplicate something if you need to go back and find something that you've lost. Um, so this can be fairly uh, simple. You can just create a Word document that has like a title of the databases and the search terms below it. Um, you know, you can even copy and paste from the search boxes to get the exact search that you did. Um, and that it will just keep things a little bit organized for you. Uh, another thing that you can do, and this will help you not just during your searching, but later on as you move forward to write your paper, is to use a good reference management software. So I have three listed here. So Taro, RefWorks, and EndNote. RefWorks and EndNote are both proprietary, but Zotero is open source and is free. Uh, so I'm going to focus on that one since all of you will have access to it. So you see here that this is the um, PubMed search screen that we looked at before. 
And uh, you'll notice up here in the address box, uh, there's a folder. And this is actually a Zotero plugin. Uh, it looks a little bit differently depending on what sort of resources are on the page. Um, because there are multiple articles uh, on this page, it looks like a folder. Uh, but sometimes it will look like a disk if there's media, or just a page if it's a single article. Uh, so if you click on that, it brings up this box that you see in the middle of the screen that says Select Items. And from here you can select which articles on this page you want to import into your library. And then when you say OK, it will save them into your library. And you can see down in the right-hand corner of the screen, there's this little um, pop-up that says Saving to My Library. It's also possible to uh, export to your library in other fashions. Most databases uh, will allow you to export to just about any type of reference management software. And there will be some kind of link uh, much like this send to link that you see right above the select items box that will allow you to export various types of files. So now we're going to um, go ahead and look at how things look in the Zotero library. So if you click on the Zotero, just the word Zotero that's in the right hand corner uh, bottom, of your screen, it brings up this library that you see here. Uh, and here you can um, move things around, you can see information, you can do all sorts of things in this library. Um, so I'm gonna, going to go to this Unfiled Items folder to see all of the items that I just imported that haven't been filed anywhere yet. Uh, so you see that list here in the center of the screen. Um, so now from here I can move these to a folder that I have already created or create a new folder. So this will allow you to really organize things um, however you would like. You can have multiple folders, uh, you can even have a hierarchy of folders. So another great thing that this reference management software is going to allow you to do is to see if there are duplicate items. So you, over in the left hand box right above the unfiled items, you'll see that there's a duplicate items tab. So we're going to go to that. And you see here it's listed some articles that it thinks may be duplicates. Um, so you can go through the information that's on the right hand pane for each article so that you can determine whether or not these really are duplicates. And if they are, then you can merge the items together. So this will make things a lot easier when you're searching multiple databases that may overlap to make sure that you aren't importing the same article into your library over and over again. It will just make things a lot easier. Um, so here I'm going to go and take a look at uh, what the information pane for a single article looks like. Uh, and so over in this right hand pane, you see that there are four tabs. There's an information tab and that um, tells you all of the basic information about the article. The title, the author, it usually imports the abstract and various other information as well. You then have a notes tab. A notes tab will allow you to add whatever notes you want to about this article, uh, which should really help you in keeping track of things. Um, then you have this tags tab. And I highlighted this one because I wanted you to see that this um, Zotero will automatically try to import these tags for you, uh, but you can also add your own tags. Um, so, you know, Dr. Lanny was talking about organizing things by themes. You could tag these with various themes, uh, which will just allow you to search for these again later. Uh, you can also use this related tab, which will allow you to relate multiple articles to each other so that you know that you've thought about this and you think that these two articles or three articles go together. Uh, so that will just really allow you to, when you have a lot of articles, to make sure that everything really is organized. And because um, of the way that this is set up, you know, it, it's saved into your library. You don't have to worry about where these notes are. 
uh, where on your computer they are, they're all there. So as I said, uh, you can search for these things. Um, once you have, you know, applied tags, you can search by those tags, but you can search really by any field, and you see that search box up here highlighted. Um, so once you have a very large library, uh, this will just make things a little bit easier to find the articles that you're looking for. Uh, so I also wanted to mention a few things that are going to be fairly useful to you later on as you're writing. So one of those things that all of these reference management softwares are going to allow you to do is to create a bibliography from these records. Uh, so that's what I, I've highlighted here. I'm creating a bibliography based off of all of the articles that are in this chamomile benefits folder. Um, so if you just go ahead and click that, you'll see a box like this pops up. And you can see up here in the citation style, there are all sorts of citation styles here. So you can choose the one that you want. Um, you can create a bibliography. You could even create an annotated bibliography. And there are many ways of exporting these. Um, so that will just make creating your reference section a lot easier. So I just want to conclude by mentioning a few other functions that are probably going to be useful for you as well. Uh, so the first of these, in-text citations. Um, no matter what reference management software it is, it usually has some way of doing this so that as you're writing your paper, you can just place markers and then at the end it will go back and do all of the formatting for you for all of the in-text citations. Um, all of these software also allow for file attachments, so PDFs of your articles. Uh, many of them will even automatically import those PDFs for you when you're um, importing data from a, a database. Uh, they're almost all online, so you can access them from multiple locations. So if you're at the library and using a library computer, uh, you still have access to it and most of them will also allow you to share. So if you want to share your collection with someone, say your advisor or whoever, you'll be able to do that as well. So now I'll just hand this back over to Dr. Lanny. First of all, thank you very much for the, for the help around the search and around Zotero. That's a terrific um, uh, service that you've just done for everyone. And I hope uh, everyone who did not hear it fully, we will, uh, we will look to increase that volume um, so when we when you hear it replayed, you can hear it more clearly, and that'll be available on the website for free. Okay, I will guarantee if we assist you with the search in Zotero, you won't have to have any hearing problems whatsoever. Okay, I guarantee that. All right. So now on with the writing. But again, thank you, Rebecca. We really appreciate that. So for the writing, you know, once you have all the articles and you read through them, okay. Now, you go to write. You don't have to cite everything that you read, okay? Be selective. Think about the evidence in a courtroom, right? They don't present everything about that human being's life, okay? What they present is the relevant, very selective evidence, okay? Evidence that is helping you get to that research question, all right? Again, always drive into that question, all right? The strong argument there. You have to provide evidence to that reader why you're doing that, all right? All right. Obviously, don't quote to death, and I have several quotation marks there. People, if it's a if it's a, a seminal source, obviously quote it. Okay. If it's Erickson, who developed psychosocial, okay, then you need to quote that, or the first person who started looking at it. Of course, you need to quote that. All right. But just a relevant quote. You don't have to recite their entire theory. Okay. All right. Again, make it easy for the reader. Use subheadings, summarize things, transition between paragraphs, have topic sentences. Make it easy for the reader. We can assist you with this, but but think about you know show it to people. And again, uh, you know we, we can help, but but keep those things in mind when you're writing. All right, all right. Some conclusions. So. The bottom, one bottom line is, is that you need to solidify that argument. Everybody, if they, if they jump right into any part of that intro or lit review, they need to say, 
how is this relevant to the study? Okay, it has to have some relevance. That evidence in that courtroom has to be relevant. Make that case. And you can make that case if they go back and they look at the subheading, right? They say, oh, okay, we're looking at gender differences, in my example. Or, oh, we're looking at, okay, bullying. Okay, so it has to make sense, all right? Here's for my own dissertation, and I have to tell you, it's taken many years. I never thought that I would talk about my dissertation at all, but here I am, and you guys may be too, all right? And, and well, it's taken over a decade, all right, <laughs> to come back to this, but here's one example of healing, all right? Here's some of the things from my own dissertation when I'm concluding that lit review, right? Several questions were stimulated by these findings. This was literally in my dissertation. One puzzling finding was limitations were, I also wondered about, okay? Given these questions and limitations regarding these studies, okay, now I present and address these questions. And then I get right into my research questions. That solidif that's the whole point, that whole intro and lit review. You're building a context and an argument why you're doing this study. And at the end of that intro, pardon me, of that literature review, I said, I'm going to evaluate two, two primary questions. One, is there validity in what we're doing? And is there reliability in what we're doing? Okay? Or have reliability and validity. So everything is driving to those questions. Logical. Critically think all the way through it. Okay? All right. So um, I'm going to take questions in just a moment. You can just write it into the um, into your chat window. All right. Um, okay. So a couple of things about qualitative in particular. Phenomenological research. Okay. We're trying to get at the lived experience of people. Right. What's it like to be bullied? What's it like to be the bullier? Right. People bully. What's their experience of bullying? They feel good about themselves. They feel worse about themselves. How, how does that differ between the genders, okay? How does that differ between age groups? Get their lived experience. Get the texture of those factors, okay? And descriptions, okay? Comprehensive, encompassing descriptions of those experiences. Other types of grounded theory qualitative research questions, right? You're getting at the process of things, right? Okay? How is bullying change? How do people go from, you know, an innocent little boy or girl to a bullying person? How has that changed over time, all right? What is the process that helped or hindered them be a bullier or be bullied, right? Is it a slow progress? How do things happen, all right? So the ground theory are kind of building a theory, but they're process kind of questions. The, the phenomenological is around their lived experience, okay? All right. Hypotheses, okay? At the end of the day, you need educated guesses about what you've read, right? You've been building the case, right? So a hypothesis may be, okay, gosh, you know, this intervention will reduce bullying in, you know, preteen girls, okay? So talk about how those variables interact with each other or vary over time, right? Maybe looking at bullying interventions by gender or bullying interventions, you know, from pre to post intervention. So put those variables together. I want to tell you, I have expertise in putting those hypotheses together. You give me those variables, we're going to figure out research questions and hypotheses. Definitely. And they're going to be clear. Not only clear to me, not only clear to you, they have to be clear to the reader. They have to understand. It's got to be comprehensible, okay? Hypotheses are critical. Now, I should say, in qualitative, you may just have research questions. That's fine. But when it comes to quantitative, you're going to want hypotheses. So it's just a matter of turning that question of, does that bullying invention, you know, reduce bullying in, in preteen girls? Okay. Well, that's the question. The question is, does that occur? Does reduction in bullying occur? And the hypothesis is, yes, it does. Okay. Or reduces it by this amount. All right. So the questions need to be really clear. Okay. If they're not clear in your brain and they're not clear to your neighbor or your partner, okay, and you have the expertise in this area that you looked at the literature review, that committee in IRB who sees a thousand of these things are going to send it back to you. It's going to cost you more time and money, okay? Mostly time. That's our biggest commodity. All right. So clear questions, all right? Okay. I'm going to take questions and answers. Well, I'm going to give the answers. You're going to ask the questions. And uh, I have a few of them right here. Um, 
And uh, okay, so we'll get we'll get there in a second. Okay, great. So okay, so um, so one question: When you select the articles to import in Zotero, uh, will it would it also pull in the full text of the PDF? It does pull in the the PDF for sure. Okay, so and uh, and we'll 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 put something on the website about that as well. But um, but it, it does pull in a PDF for sure. Okay. Um, how many articles are realistic to do a lit review? You know, I say as few, well, <laughs> as few as that darn committee is going to permit, all right? In my particular dissertation, I was working off an existing research program, okay? I really, you know, I had 20, 30. So, you know, you know I really, I personally know and believe you need quality over quantity. No one wants to read fluff. Think about what we just said. You want to think critically about making that argument. Is that argument going to be helped by irrelevant information? Of course not. So it has to be relevant, all right? So whatever it takes to make that argument. And if it's 15 articles, so be it, all right? But it doesn't. there's no minimal criteria. You ha How long, you know, I just talked to somebody recently. They said, hey, the brand new, brand new topic that's not been researched before, okay? You may not have a lot of articles about that then okay all right um okay let me see what else I, um okay <laughs> staying in charge of your study how do you do that when you have a strong committee member listen it's not easy i had <laughs> i you know listen when you're going through this thing you want to stick your head in the oven half the time i understand how you do that is to keep your own center Get social support. Find humor where you can. Exercise when you can. Eat well. Sleep well. Stay in balance. Don't burn out your partners and friends, okay? They don't want to hear about it, all right? So, you know, listen, you're going to do the best you can. By the way, who picked that strong committee member, okay? Take some responsibility for what's going on. I do have to say, most people, and I've been around, most people who change committee members it costs them time, okay? And as an old friend used to say, better the devil you know than the one you don't. So if you go and switch from this tough committee member, it may not be so easy to get back on track, and they may be tougher still. So at least you know what you're dealing with, okay? All right. So what if the topic is huge? I'm studying bullying and stress and depressive symptoms and cortisol. Awesome. Thousands of articles. So look for the really relevant one. I mean, Rebecca talked about some of those narrowing strategies, okay? So look to narrow it down to, you know, perhaps the, the population that you want to look at or the instruments or the measures, okay, or the procedures used. Maybe somebody was using observational observation. Somebody was looking at social media. Someone was, you know, so look to, look to narrow down, okay? Um, okay. Uh, what length of time is reasonable for conducting a dissertation study, in your opinion? Listen, everybody that I'm talking to right now that's an earshot, okay, I want you to graduate in 2014. There's no reason why, with support, be it us or other people, you cannot get a prospectus down, okay, and we've talked about some of that stuff in the introduction, and then get a proposal with kind of an introduction and and uh, a lit review, okay, and get a method down. We're experts at the method. Get support. There's no reason why that can't happen, okay? Now, don't shoot yourself in the foot by trying to get some, you know, that you can't get your hands on the population. A woman this, this afternoon said, I want to study the difference between the achievement between those that are deaf in the uh, deaf schools versus those in other schools that handle uh, deaf individuals. But she said, my school only has 10 to 15 people. Okay, you're already causing yourself trouble. So you better start thinking about being able to, the, the, the bone. you have to be able to get in touch with those participants. If I want to study presidents and interested in IQ by, you know, affiliation, and there's only five of them alive, this is going to be a tough study to do. And do any kind of inferential stats. So <clears throat> be mindful of clear questions, clear instruments, clear procedure to get it, okay? All right. Um, 
I presume that Zotera is going to, uh, it's Zotera, not Zotera. It's a Z O T E R A. I presume that's going to work for a Mac. That's going to be fine. Um, can you suggest terms for looking at a sense of community? That's very specific. So, um, different terms. I mean, listen, we're happy to assist. I mean, I'll move over here, okay? We're happy to assist with, you know, lit reviews or bibliographies or help with the research questions. You can email us or call us and we can work through specific specific issues, okay? Um, okay, uh, the concept paper is similar to the prospectus. Typically, the concept paper comes first, which is this basic, here's my idea, okay? And then they say, okay, great, let's move to the prospectus. By the way, contact us for the, uh, if you're working on a prospectus, we have a great little paper um, uh, that we snagged along the way that, you know, finishing the prospectus in one quarter. And I know it's realistic, and I know that you can do it. Um, what's the best way to find the gap in literature? Well, in my example, right, you know, th these particular articles were looking at, you know, interventions around males, right? Back in the old days, they only studied males. So it was easy to find a gap in literature. They didn't test these things on females. So um, look at the conclude. Look in the conclusion section. First of all, think critically. Think critically about the question at hand that's being answered. Okay, and think for yourself. Okay, what's missing here? What are they? What measures are they not looking at? What participants are they not looking at? Okay, think about what they're doing. And when you look at numerous articles, you can say, "Gosh, no one has looked at this population or the elderly." or looked at it with this new instrument, okay? Or they looked at it 10 years ago, but they didn't look at it now, okay? How would things perhaps change? So keep that in mind. And then also you can look into the, um, of course, look into the conclusion. They're going to tell you future research. So if you find a, a recent article, they're going to tell you future research can look at A, B, C, or D. And when you look at lots of these articles, you're going to come up with, Hey, a lot of people are saying we need to be looking at this. So that's one way to kind of get at the gap in the literature. Um, so, okay, I'm going to take a few more. Um, okay, in a dissertation with uh, 50 more, you're welcome over there. Okay, Ebert. Um, okay, so what else? Can you modify an existing instrument? Love that. Love that. How that typically happens is that, I, first of all, I love that because an existing instrument is going to have reliability and validity with it, associated with it. Awesome question. So what you can do is, and they put it in a table, and you say, here's question one from that instrument, from that reliable, valid instrument. Here's how I'm changing it, and here is the new question. So you're showing the reader the old question, how it's changed in the new question. Okay? All right. Um, so great question. Um, don't worry about copywriting things yet. Um, you know, so as you're going through the, uh, the, 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 the articles, for sure, look at those existing instruments, okay? Um, okay, how can you develop research questions? And I'll just finish up with this, I guess, with, uh, with Terry. Good questions because it really... You should really know what you want to study. I know it doesn't seem that way, but it's true. You should really know what you want to study. Something has already sparked something in you. You don't have to be passionate, passionate. You're not marrying it. You're just marrying it for, you know, a few quarters here, okay? So the best research questions, one way to do it is to I like to work backwards, okay? All right? Think about the methodology. Think about the data I can get. Well, I can get information on bullying. Okay, I can search people's uh, Facebooks, okay? Okay, those are the variables. Well, I can look at that pre and post intervention, okay? So one way is to see secondary data or just variables of interest, okay? There's tons of topics around all kinds of things. And uh, look at the data, and then we can develop questions from there. And, and I guess that leads into this, you know, last slide, which is, you know, we can, we can assist you personally with problem statements, okay? The significance, why is this important? The framework, what's the theory of this thing? That's kind of introduction, perspective stuff. Certainly, 
We can engage with lit reviews, okay, or annotate the bibliography, or synergize it, or synthesize it, rather, and then help with the research questions, all right? So whatever capacity to be able to see yourself in 2014, all right? I want all of you, truthfully, everyone that's listening, okay, I want you to hold your diploma in your hand and at the end of 2014 and say, all of my efforts have worked, okay, to have the hat on your head, to hear the applause of, of, of people supporting you. You know, we all came to do this for different reasons, okay? And I've read many dedications, a lot of remembrances too. Remind yourself of the meaning that you're bringing to this, okay? Everybody's taking a long journey here. Congratulations, sincerely, congratulations. Remember what you're doing. Get support. Envision yourself in 2014. Get the support you need. We offer dissertation consulting. We can help with intro, lit, method, results, okay? So get the help you need, all right? You can email us. You can call us. We'll get you in in a few weeks, okay? And if there's an emergency, tell us, all right? We're going to answer all the questions that we didn't get to via email. So don't worry if we didn't get to your question. We'll look to write them up over the next day or so and get them to you, okay? All right. So. Finally, I just want to thank you all sincerely for your participation. Everyone who, uh, particularly who uh, came and told us what you did for a living, we're interested in that. <clears throat> How to help us reach out to you, we're interested in that. Any feedback you have, please forward it to us in that email right there. All right. And um, join us for the next webinar. We're going to be talking about the methodology and how to get through RRB and URR without spending a quarter doing that, okay? And it's Wednesday, March the 26th, 8.30 Eastern Time. You know, connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And I just want to thank you again all. And, uh, and again, envision you graduating. Congratulations, and, uh, and, and thank you again. All righty. I'm going to wish you all a great night. All right, bye-bye now.